video I'm going to talk you through the solutions to the summer 2021 Cambridge IGCSE core questions. In question 15 we have a scatter diagram and we have to put a ring around the correct statement about the scatter diagram. Okay so they give you four statements here. This one saying there's no correlation. Here it's not possible to tell if there's correlation as there are not enough points negative correlation and positive correlation. Well, hopefully you can see in this scatter diagram there's negative correlation because as one of the variables increases, the other one decreases, okay? So the points, they're slanting this way, a bit like if you have a line, there's a negative gradient, okay? So this scatter diagram shows negative correlation. In part B, we've been given four different scatter diagrams. Okay, and on each one, there's a straight line drawn. It says, complete the statement. Okay, the line in diagram something is the most appropriate line of best fit. Well, I've written it in already here. It's diagram C. Okay, this is the most appropriate line of best fit because it follows the points that have been plotted on the scatter diagram the most closely. Okay, this line is drawn below the points. This line doesn't follow the trend of points at all. And this one that goes through the origin, well, it has most of the points above the line and only two points below the line. This one has roughly the same amount of points on either side of the line, okay? So this is the most appropriate line of best fit. In question 16, it says a cuboid has a square base. The volume of this cuboid is 867 centimeters cubed and its height is 12 centimeters. Calculate the length of one side of the square base. So in a question like this, it's a good idea just to draw yourself a diagram. So here there's a cuboid and I've remembered to draw a square base here. Okay, and we don't know the length of the sides. That's what we're trying to work out. So I've just labeled them X and here the height is 12. So usually to work out the volume of a prism, you would work out the area of the cross section. So if you like here, the area of this face here. So in this question, to work out the area of this square, you would just do base times height. So X multiplied by X. And x multiplied by x is the same thing as x squared. Then once you've worked out the area of the cross section, you need to multiply the answer by the length of the prism, or, the, or in this case, the height. So here we've got 12. Okay, And we know the volume because it's been given in the question. It's 867. So instead of writing V here, you could replace that with 867. Okay, So now we have an equation and we can solve this to work out the value of X. So to solve this equation, the first thing you should do is divide both sides of the equation by 12. So when I divide this side by 12, this just cancels. And on the left-hand side, you would divide by 12. And then you need to square root both sides. So when you square root the right-hand side, you're just left with x. And if you square root the left-hand side and put that in the calculator, you should get 8.5. Okay, so that is the value of x. And so that is the length of one side of the square base. Okay, so in question 17, it says a rhombus has side length 6.5 centimeters. The rhombus can be constructed by drawing two triangles. Using a ruler and compasses only, construct the rhombus. Leave in your construction arcs. One diagonal of the rhombus has been drawn for you. Okay, so this is one of the diagonals of the rhombus. And a rhombus is a four-sided shape that has four sides that are equal in length to each other. Okay, so it's a bit like a wonky square, if you like. So when it says construct the rhombus, it means we're going to draw the rhombus. So you need to take your compass and make sure the tip of your compass has a distance of 6.5 centimeters with the tip of your pencil. So use a ruler just to measure that distance. Once it's set to 6.5, you need to place the compass point on one end of the diagonal and draw a nice big arc above that line and one below. Then you need to switch ends, 
place your compass point on the opposite end of that line and do the same thing. Okay, so you need to draw an arc above that line and below, making sure those new arcs cross over with the previous ones. Now you can take a pencil and a straight edge or a ruler and you need to join up where the arcs cross each other with either end of the diagonal. And then you need to do the same thing with the arcs underneath. Okay, so you should be able to see now we have a rhombus, four-sided shape, okay, with four equal sides and the opposite angles which are equal to each other. And remember, leave in your construction arcs, okay, as that is how you will get full marks for this question. In question 18, it says, without using a calculator, work out two thirds divided by one and three sevenths. You must show all your working and give your answer as a fraction in its simplest form. So what you should do first is rewrite this mixed number, one and three sevenths, as an improper fraction. Okay, so to do that, you have to multiply the number one by the denominator. So one times seven is seven, and then you have to add the number three. So one times seven is seven, plus the three gives you 10, and that gives you the numerator of that fraction, and the denominator stays the same, okay? So the denominator is still seven. Now, when you're dividing fractions, it's the same as multiplying them together, but when you multiply, you have to remember to switch the second fraction upside down, okay? So it becomes seven over 10. Now you can multiply the two numerators together. So 2 multiplied by 7 is 14. And then you multiply the two denominators together. So 3 multiplied by 10 is 30. And remember, you have to write uh, the fraction in its simplest form in order to get full marks. So uh, these are both even numbers. They're both divisible by 2. Okay, there's a common factor. So 14 divided by 2 is 7. And 30 divided by 2 is 15. And I can't simplify this fraction any further. Okay, there isn't a common factor um, between these numbers 7 and 15. So that is the final answer. In question 19, it says a bag contains five red balls and three blue balls. Sophie takes a ball at random, notes its color and then puts it back in the bag. She does this a second time. So part A says complete the tree diagram. So we have to fill in the probabilities here on the dotted lines. So because the sum of probabilities is always equal to one, we know that the probabilities on these two branches have to equal one. So to work out this one, you would just subtract five eighths from the number one. So one take away five eighths is three eighths, okay? So these two probabilities always have to add together to give one, okay? And because she puts the ball back in afterwards, okay, the probabilities remain the same, okay? So the probability of taking a red is five eighths and the probability of taking a red as the second ball is still five eighths because there are still eight balls to choose from and there are still five red balls to choose from. And likewise, with the probability for blue, it was three eighths here, so it remains the same for the second ball, okay? And here, five eighths for red, three eighths for blue, okay? So there's the tree diagram. For part B, it says work out the probability that both of the balls she takes are blue. So here, the probability the first ball is three eighths, so write that down. And here, the probability the second ball is blue is also 3 eighths. And what you need to do with these probabilities is multiply them together. Okay, so a blue followed by a blue is 3 eighths multiplied by 3 eighths. And when you multiply those two fractions together, you just multiply the numerators. So 3 times 3 is 9. And then multiply the denominators. So 8 multiplied by 8 is 64. Okay, so there's the answer, 9 over 64. In question 20, it says the diagram shows two cylinders, show that the two cylinders are mathematically similar. So 
If they're similar, they should have the same scale factor. And to find the scale factor, what you need to do is divide um, the dimensions in each cylinder. So for example, if we take the smaller cylinder and I divide the height here by the diameter, so 13 divided by 5, I get 2.6. If I do the same thing with the large cylinder, so the height divided by the diameter, so 32.5 divided by 12.5, I also get 2.6. So because we get the same result, okay, after the division, it means the cylinders are mathematically similar. In question 21, part A, we have to write this number in standard form. So for the number to be in standard form, we need to place the decimal in a position so that this number lies between 1 and 10. So to do that, we need to place the decimal in between the 6 and the 5. So it would become 6.54. Okay, so this number is between 1 and 10. Then you need to write down multiply by 10, okay? You always need to write that down, okay, when you're writing in standard form. And then you need to count how many places the decimal has moved, if you like. Okay, so it used to be here, and it's moved one, two, three places to the right. Okay, so because it's moved three places to the right, this power here is negative three. OK, when this is a small number, so a number less than one, this power should be negative. OK, so it's the same number. OK, we've just rewritten that number in standard form. For part B, it says the number 1.467 times 10 to the power of 102 is written as an ordinary number. OK, so not in standard form. OK, so it will have lots and lots of digits that will would, wouldn't fit on this page probably if we were to write them out. Write down the number of zeros that follow the digit 7. So this power 102 means the decimal point should move 102 places to the right from here. So here we've got three numbers. So if you like we can already imagine this decimal point moving 1, 2, three places to the right. If I take away three from 102, I'm left with 99. That means there should be 99 zeros after that number seven for this number to be written as an ordinary number. Okay, so that is the answer. It's 99 zeros. In question 22, it says the diagram shows a quadrilateral, work out the value of x, and we've been given angles or the expression of angles in this quadrilateral, so we need to use the fact that all four angles in a quadrilateral always add up to 360 degrees, okay, and use that to form and solve an equation. So I'm going to add these four angles together, so 4x plus 90 plus 87 minus x plus 3x plus 75. And remember, when we add those four angles together, they should equal 360 degrees. So let's just tidy up the left-hand side of this equation. So 4x take away 1x is 3x, plus another 3x is 6x. Then if I add these numbers together, uh, 90 plus 87 plus 75 should equal 252. And on the right-hand side, we still have 360. Now this equation is looking a lot easier to solve. I need to minus 252 on both sides of the equation. So when I minus on the left-hand side, this just cancels. And if I minus 252 from 360, I get 108. Then if I divide both sides of the equation by 6, I get x is equal to 18. So that is the value of x. For question 23, it says work out the lowest common multiple, or LCM, of 24 and 54. Now, there are other methods to work out the lowest common multiple, but I think for this question, the quickest and easiest way to do this is just to write out the numbers in the 24 times table.
And then the same thing with 54. Write out the numbers in the 54 times table. The first number that occurs in both times tables is the lowest common multiple. Okay, so the number 216 is here and also over here. So there is the LCM. For question 24, we have to expand and simplify the brackets. So for the first bracket, I'm multiplying all of this by 5. So 5 multiplied by 2x is 10x. And 5 multiplied by negative 7 is negative 35. Then I need to multiply the second bracket by negative 3. Okay, so negative 3 multiplied by x is negative 3x. And negative 3 multiplied by negative 5 is positive 15. And then you need to simplify those numbers. So I can group the x terms. So 10x take away 3x is 7x. And then if we look at these numbers here, negative 35 plus 15 gives us negative 20. Okay. In question 25, it says the diagram shows a sector of a circle, center O, radius 9 centimeters. The sector angle is 72 degrees. For part A, we need to calculate the length of the arc AB. Okay, so the length of this arc here. Okay, so this is part of the circumference of a circle. So it's a good idea to bear this in mind, okay? The formula to calculate circumference of a circle is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter. So if we were imagining this whole circle, for this circle, it would be pi multiplied by 18, okay? Because the diameter of the circle would be 18. But we're only working out the length of this part of the circumference, not the whole circle, okay? So what you need to add to this calculation is the fraction that this sector is as a part of the whole circle. Now, it's really easy. All you have to do is take the number of degrees of the sector, so 72, and write that number 72 out of 360 because there are 360 degrees in a whole circle. Okay, so this denominator will always be 360 for a question like this, okay? And then you multiply that fraction by the circumference, okay? So pi times diameter. So when you put that in the calculator, you should get 11.3097 dot 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 and so on. And so if we round that answer to three significant figures, we get 11.3. For part B, we have to calculate the area of the sector AOB, okay? So very similar to part A, we need to this time consider the formula for area of a circle, which is pi times the radius squared. So if we were working out the area of this full circle, it would be pi times 9 squared, because the radius is 9. But remember, it's just a part of the circle, this sector. It's not the whole circle. So you need to multiply the area by the fraction again. And it's the same fraction that we did in part A, 72 out of 360. 72 because the angle has been given here for the sector, and 360 because there are 360 degrees in a full circle. Okay, so if you put that in the calculator you should get 50.8938 and so on. So again, if we round our answer to three significant figures, we should get 50.9 because this nine rounds the eight up one to the number nine.